Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nargis Bajopli. I'm an assistant professor at uh, of Middle East Studies here at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International S uh, Studies at SICE. Today's fireside chat is part of our larger SICE's Rethinking Iran initiative, which we started in the spring of 2019. We have a very exciting lineup of speakers for the term, uh, in addition to um, Elon Goldenberg, who we, we had a couple of weeks ago, and today's esteemed guest, uh, Ambassador Bill Burns. We also have coming up next week, uh, Ariane Tabotabai uh, in November, Ambassador Wendy Sherman, and book talks with Bill Gordon, Arzu Osanlu, and Monata Hashimi, among others. Uh, you can follow us at RethinkingIran.com, uh, as well as on our social media uh, handles. So we're streaming today's event on our YouTube channel, as well as uh, the other platforms that we run, and we'll be monitoring all of these platforms uh, this hour for questions from the audience. So please do pose your questions and we'll try to get to them later in the program. Today's conversation will cover US-Iran relations at this critical juncture, but also go deeper uh, and wider and consider the future of American diplomacy uh, writ large. We're very honored to have Ambassador William Burns join us today for this critical conversation. He'll be joined uh, by my colleague, Professor Vadi Nass. Um, as a quick way of background, uh, Ambassador William Burns is, a, is president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the oldest international affairs think tank in the United States. He retired from the US Foreign Service in 2014 after a 33 year diplomatic career. He holds the highest rank in the Foreign Service career ambassador and is only the second serving career diplomat in history to become Deputy Secretary of State. Prior to his tenure as Deputy Secretary, Ambassador Burns served from 2008 to 2011 as Undersecretary for Political Affairs. He was Ambassador to Russia from 2005 to 2008, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from 2001 to 2005, and Ambassador to Jordan from 1998 to 2001. Professor Vadi Nass is a Majid Khadouri Professor of Middle East Studies and International Affairs at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and spearheads the Rethinking Iran series. He is the author of many books, including The Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy and Retreat, Forces of Fortune, The Rise of the New Muslim Middle Class and What It Means for Our World and the Shia Revival. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Dur to Ambassador Burns um, to start off with his remarks. Managas, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I really am delighted to be with all of you today, at least virtually, um, and delighted to be at an institution, SAIS, um, for which I have such respect. And, you know, always happy to be with Ali Nasser, or moderator, for whom I have great respect. Um, what I thought I'd do at the outset, as Vali had suggested, um, is just offer a few very brief remarks before we get to, you know, more in-depth discussion of Middle East strategy and the challenge of Iran um, about, you know, the, the wider challenges for American foreign policy as we look ahead beyond our election. And I would just you strike two broad themes at the outset. The first is to talk a little bit about the international landscape that'll await whomever's selected president on November 3rd, and then talk a little bit about some of the wider foreign policy choices that that administration will face. And again, I look forward very much to talking about some of the particular Middle East issues shortly. Um, on the landscape, I think the first thing I'd stress is that, um, you know, well before Donald Trump was elected president um, and entered office in January of 2017, um, and certainly well before the pandemic broke, um, we had entered into one of those rare moments of transition on the international landscape, one of those plastic moments that comes along maybe a couple of times a century. The pandemic, I think, has accelerated and exposed a lot of pre-existing conditions on that international landscape. And I'd highlight three of them. First is, and most obvious, I think are major shifts in the balance of power among states, particularly with the rise of China. Second, major transformations beyond the reach of any one state, climate change, the single biggest existential threat to human society today, global health, which we're reminded of with this terrible pandemic, the revolution in technology, and the challenge of developing workable rules of the road to 
take advantage of its benefits and minimize its dislocations. And then a third, um, I think, pre-existing condition, which is major uncertainties about the role of the main driver of the old international order, my country, the United States, now seen by too many people around the world as drunk at the wheel, um, drifting amidst domestic dysfunction and economic inequality, continuing problems of racial injustice, um, and a political polarization, which has infected our diplomacy and undermined in some very real ways our image and influence in the world. But if the pandemic has accelerated and exposed those pre existing conditions, it also helps clarify our choices. I would argue that while the US is no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block today, um, that we still have a better hand to play than any of our major rivals. And I say that not just because of our economic and military leverage, as important as they are, but because of two capacities. The first is the capacity to invest in alliances, to shape partnerships, to mobilize coalitions of countries, to help set rules of the road, a capacity which sets us apart, at least today, from lonelier powers like China or Russia. The second capacity is a capacity for self-repair, which I've always thought is the most exceptional trait. Um, and exceptionalism is sometimes an overused term in thinking about America and its role in the world. But our most exceptional trait really has been that capacity for self-repair to pick ourselves up when we make mistakes or we run into problems. I never thought in my professional lifetime that we test that capacity for self-repair um, as seriously and intensively as we've done recently. So the question before us and before a new administration, I think, is really gonna be, can it revive those two capacities? Can it put those cards back in the American hand and can it play that hand effectively? Which leads me to my second point about foreign policy choices. I think if Donald Trump is reelected and here I betray my own prejudices, but I think you know, you can assume a continuation of a lot of the patterns that we've seen over the last four years. Uh, a continued dismissiveness toward allies, a deep skepticism about the value of inter international cooperation on some of those big transformational challenges like climate that I mentioned before, an attitude of indulgence toward most autocrats around the world, a unilateralist impulse in dealing with competition with China that gives short shrift to the importance of working with allies and partners in managing that competition. And I think a continuing destructive attitude toward the institutions of American governance, especially in the national security area, especially in my old institution, the State Department as well, where what we've seen in recent years, I think, is a war on an imaginary deep state that's in effect created a weak state, you know, a set of institutions that are battered and belittled and less capable of defending American democracy and, and promoting our role, our role in the world. If Vice President Biden is elected, then and I obviously think that the prospects for America um, developing and conducting an effective foreign policy strategy are infinitely better, but it's still gonna be a tall order because the world that, Vice President Biden left in January of 2017 is not the same one that a newly elected President Biden would, re would return to in January of 2021. The domestic inheritance will be overwhelming with the pandemic uh, likely to be resurging with huge challenges of economic recovery um, and the bandwidth for a new administration um, in spending a lot of capital on foreign policy I think is gonna be quite limited. The challenge will be, I think, navigating between the twin temptations of restoration on the one hand, the illusion that you can just flip a switch and restore America's relationships and its influence to what we imagined them to be in 2016 or a decade or two decades before that, during the height of the moment of singular American dominance in the world. I think that's an illusion because the world has shifted. Um, but it's equally an illusion in my view to think that retrenchment, a, a massive retrenchment from American engagement in the world, as opposed to a disciplined, restrained uh, pursuit of American interests and values, that that retrenchment doesn't come with considerable costs as well. Um, and, and so I think the challenge will be to reinvent uh, 
American foreign policy strategy and, and the institutions that support it for a new era. And I think three priorities would be, it seems to me, most important. The first is domestic renewal. First, to be honest about the fact that there's a pretty big disconnect across America right now between people like me, card-carrying members of the Washington establishment, and a lot of American citizens who don't necessarily need to be persuaded of the importance of active American engagement in the world to help <clears throat> further their security and their prosperity. But they're a lot more skeptical about the capacity of the Washington establishment for a disciplined leadership, for matching ends to means. Um, after years in which we've often overreached in foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, but not exclusively there, and where it's been obvious to too many people that globalization isn't lifting all boats in our society, and that the gap between rich and poor um, and the dis disaffection that I think is produced by that um, is only growing. A second huge, and so what that means, I think, is on you know a number of specific areas and helping to drive home to American citizens, the connection between a smart foreign policy and domestic renewal. It's obviously true with regard to global health cooperation and getting American society out of the you know, dangers of the pandemic and moving on to a, a healthier era. Uh, it's obvious with regard to climate change and the importance of working with others around the world to move toward you know, a clean energy future. It's obvious with regard to immigration where you can't separate the importance of both secure borders and you know, enough gateways for immigrants that produce dynamism for our economy and our society. You can't separate that from the importance of smart foreign policy in dealing with Mexico or Central America and helping to anchor people in that, in that part of the world in a sense of possibility and security in their own societies. Um, the second priority is obviously, again, um, as I said, resuming a kind of central organizing role for the United States uh, in dealing with those big transformational challenges of climate. So not just returning to the Paris Climate Agreement, but actually we're ro rolling up our sleeves and working hard in terms of a transformed domestic agenda and integrating it. Um, with work with allies and partners and players around the world. The same is true, um, I think, with regard to um, you know, other areas like working with like-minded countries to develop work workable rules of the road um, to deal with the revolution in technology. And then last but not least, the third priority and the biggest geopolitical challenge for the United States as far out as I can see into the 21st century, which is managing competition with China. Um, because I think it's fair to say that nothing is going to matter more to the success or failure of American foreign policy in the decades ahead than how well or how poorly we deal with that central issue of managing competition with China. Here, I think the diagnosis that you see from the Trump administration and many Democrats um, is similar in a lot of ways. The importance of pushing back against predatory Chinese trade and investment practices for example. But I think the prescriptions um, vary or differ in some important ways. I think the Trump administration has been defiantly unilateralist um, in most respects in dealing with those differences with China. Um, instead of making common cause with other players who are concerned about Chinese economic behavior like Japan or the European Union, the Trump administration has started second and third front trade conflicts with them. I think you'd see a different approach in a Biden administration, a focus on investing in that web of partners and allies from India all the way across Asia to our treaty allies in Japan and South Korea um, in an effort not so much to prevent China's rise, which I think is beyond the capacity of the United States, but to shape the environment into which it rises, to avoid lazy assumptions about the inevitability of confrontation or the workability of massive decoupling of our economies, recognizing that there are some areas where it's gonna be important to decouple in some ways to reduce vulnerabilities in areas that are important to American national security or to our own economy as well. But you know, um, an effort to avoid the kind of cosmic crusades and cosmic zero sum struggles in an era in which 
there are certain issues on which we're almost doomed to cooperation between the United States and China, whether it's climate or global health or a number of other areas, even as we compete intensely with one another across a range of other issues as well. This will not just be a function of American strategy in Asia. It'll also be a function of effective American strategy across the Atlantic and in North America. I don't think it's impossible um, to build uh, complementary and coordinated approaches to China between the United States and our principal European allies, even if they're not identical strategies. And similarly, I think it's going to be very important to reinvest in our natural strategic home base in North America in relations with Canada and Mexico, for example. You know, it's been a rare feat of diplomacy for this administration to have pissed off the Canadians in recent years. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here to rebuild those situations of strength geopolitically that matter enormously to the United States as we look ahead to a very complicated and unforgiving international landscape. So that's, I'm sorry to go on so long, Valley, but that's what I'd offer by way of a broad picture of you know, American foreign policy choices on a complicated landscape in the years ahead, well beyond our election. Thank you very much, Bill. So first of all, let me start by saying how, how, how delighted I am to welcome you back to SICE and, and uh, for us and our students and our community to hear your, your wisdom. Uh, you know, I, I think these were some very important uh, big points uh, about where does American foreign policy go uh, uh, if we have a particularly a new administration and, and uh, uh, how do we sort of reinvent the way forward. A, a lot of the themes that you touched on uh, are very much the subject of debate about the Middle East. And as you know, for instance, we are now caught in a discussion as to whether the United States should withdraw or uh, whether it should... Uh, continue to, to stay in the Middle East. Uh, I think maybe at some level, President Trump is trying to do both. Uh, some days of the week, he says, all our troops are gonna be home by Christmas and we really don't need to be there unless they pay us uh, for, for, for security. And some other days he sends additional troops and his, his maximum pressure policy on Iran really demands even more American resources if it's to be, if it's to be sustained. Uh, and, I, and I also, the other thing that you raised that, 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 that the American foreign policy has to have meaning for people in the heartland, that, that, uh, that, that average Americans outside of the um, uh, East Coast corridor don't identify with many of the priorities of American foreign policy. So if I were to sort of ask you to think about the Middle East, at least at a, at a sort of a general level, if we were to think about how do we reinvent American foreign policy uh, towards the Middle East. Uh, what you know? What would it look like? And also, how how can how can Middle East matter to average Americans in ways uh, that that is not just about counterterrorism and 9/11? Uh, let's say, hopefully, those sorts of issues are not behind us at least by and large. So why would the Middle East matter to the Americans uh, or um, if we don't care about oil there and, and we're not afraid of terrorism. So I, I just wanted to sort of see how does this apply to the Middle East? Sure. sure. Well, you've written about this elegant, elegantly in, in recent weeks as well, but I think I share your view that first we have to be honest with ourselves. We've overreached badly in the Middle East and especially in the last 20 years in the post 9-11 period. You know, most obviously, most vividly, most painfully in the war in Iraq in 2003 and the years beyond that. Um, but I think we've been guilty in many ways of a kind of magical thinking about our capacity to transform societies in a very complicated part of the world. By the same token, I, I don't believe that the United States can afford to totally disengage from the Middle East. You are right that objectively the United States is no longer nearly as dependent as we once were on energy resources from the Gulf or from the region, even though we have a stake in, in a global economy, which depends to a greater degree on those energy resources. We certainly do have an interest, um, you know, 20 years after 9-11 in ensuring that, you know, terrorist groups with, with global reach um, can no longer establish themselves in the Middle East and threaten, you know, the American homeland. I think we have a continuing interest in helping to ensure that no single hostile power establishes a dominant position in the Middle East. Um, I think we have a continuing interest in 
doing what we can um, to help ensure that the dysfunctions, the disorder, the insecurities of the Middle East don't spill out into Europe, into other parts of the world, as we've seen in recent years. Um, I think we, we certainly have a continuing interest in doing what we can, not only to deepen relationships or, um, you know, uh, contribute to the defense of, you know, important partners like Israel and others in the region, but I think an interest in doing everything we can to help ease tensions, to help resolve or at least better manage conflicts. So that argues, in my view, not for um, you know, a blanket disengagement. It argues for learning the lessons, the painful lessons of our overreach and shifting the terms of our engagement in the Middle East, um, shifting toward a much greater emphasis on diplomacy backed up by military and economic leverage, not the other way around. And we were guilty of a kind of inversion of those instruments of American foreign policy for too long in the Middle East. Um, it argues for, uh, I think, a rebalancing of some of our relationships in the region, you know, with the US-Saudi relationship, where I think, you know, in, in the Trump era, there's been an almost blanket indulgence of the current Saudi leadership. And I think when I talk about rebalancing, I'm not talking about a total rupture, but because we still have important interests in that relationship, but I am talking about being honest and blunt on questions of Saudi overreach. You know, whether it's in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in a Saudi diplomatic facility in Istanbul or the terrible overreach in Yemen, you know, which has become not only a humanitarian catastrophe, but a strategic catastrophe as well. And so, you know, there are a number of other areas where I think we need to recalibrate, I think, a little bit the way in which we use diplomacy. But I think that that, you know, shift toward a greater emphasis on diplomacy a greater realism and our expectations. And I guess the last point I'd make would be a continuing focus on the deeper drivers of dysfunction in the region. You know, it's almost a decade now since the Arab Spring. The sense of indignity, you know, the sense of a lack of opportunity, whether it's for political expression or, or um, economic mobility, um, that helped produce in many Arab societies at least um, that uprising nearly a decade ago um, still exists. And it's gonna bubble over again unless leaderships and societies with encouragement um, and sometimes blunt and candid encouragement from you know, outside players like the United States aren't able to begin to address some of those challenges as well. So all of that is much easier said than done, but I do think we need to shift the terms of our engagement um, in significant ways. But I would say, uh, uh, at least the way you lay it out, is actually much larger agenda for the Middle East than, than one of uh, one of uh, uh, the idea of, of uh, withdrawing from the region, which has now some resonance, uh, in both political parties on the on the right and and the left. Uh, the the other theme uh, that that you raised, Bill, was the issue of China, and uh, you know we we've now got familiar with the Russian presence in the Middle East, in Syria, in Libya, uh, uh, with OPEC and Saudi Arabia, in Afghanistan. But China until now had had a minimal sort of a role. And, and uh, just at the same time as the United States is adopting a very different posture towards China, and at least in public discussions, we'll talk about a potential Cold War or much more of a conflictual relationship, we're sort of seeing uh, uh, China also expand at least uh, uh, in, in new ways in the region. I mean, uh, uh, sort of over the past month, there's been talk of a strategic partnership with Iran, although uh, the, the actual content of it is yet to be decided, that the Chinese are working with Saudi Arabia to enable them to develop nuclear uh, capability. Uh, and it sometimes looks that it might be going beyond just, uh, uh, you know, below the radar, uh, um, um, uh, commercial activity, and I, I, and you know historically, I would say perhaps you know our East Asia policy and our Middle East policy have been separate. Uh, but I, I was wondering, how do you see management of China sort of infringing on the Middle East or our priorities in the Middle East? Uh, you know, impacting the way we handle China, and and how do we think about? Uh, sort of this this conflict between United States and 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 China now sort of being su superimposed on the region in in, in some manner. 
No, it's a really good question, Vali. I mean, I think, you know, we may think we can separate East Asia policy from Middle East policy, but I think the Chinese tend to, you know, uh, connect the dots among those issues. And so, for example, you know, China's Belt and Road Initiative and its obvious ambition, which is not purely an economic ambition, it's a long-term strategic one, to extend its influence, you know, outside of Asia, across Central Asia and into the Middle East, um, you know, is is part of a serious long-term strategy. Now, you know, I think it's it's also true that the Chinese will be opportunistic and take advantage of of you know openings or vacuums that develop. And I think what, in my view, has been a foolish policy toward Iran in this administration, especially after the abandonment of the Comprehensive Nuclear Agreement, has created obvious opportunities for China, no matter how hollow you know, that 25 year commitment to strategic partner may seem at the moment. From a Chinese perspective, there's a clear opportunity to try to extend a kind of strategic corridor from Central Asia all the way to the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf, building on relationships that, you know, it's already invested in over decades with Pakistan, for example. So, you know, it creates um, a real area of competition um, at a moment when, you know, other outside players like Russia have stolen most of the headlines, you know, in the awful violence in Syria and the opportunistic way in which, you know, Russia and, and Turkey on the fringes of the region have also behaved there. Um, you know, a lot of this, I think, has to do, you know, less with being reactive to Chinese strategy and more you know, an affirmative sense of the kind of strategy I was talking about before that emphasizes diplomacy. In other words, the diplomacy that, you know, to which, you know, I would hope a Biden administration would return in dealing with Iran on the nuclear issue, um, but also working with, you know, partners in the Gulf and elsewhere in the region to push back against you know, Iranian behavior that threatens our interests and the interests of friends in, in, in the region in some very important ways. Um, to be more focused on, you know, the, the challenges of economic modernization as well, and you know, especially in the Arab world right now as well, you know, as a counter in a way to, you know, the, the, the kind of influence and instruments that China can bring to bear. So we have a lot of hands to play, so long as we're careful about not overusing military instruments, um, not being fixated on our military footprint in the region, a greater emphasis on diplomacy, a greater realism in how you manage conflicts in the region as a long-term way of beginning to encourage some semblance of order in a deeply disorderly part of the world. Vali, I think you're still muted, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so let me ask you more specifically about Iran. Uh, I mean, you were uh, present at the birth of, of the conversations that led to uh, the JCPOA. You, you started uh, talking uh, uh, first with the, during the Ahmadinejad period with then uh, Iranian chief negotiator Saeed Jalili. Then you were involved in the back channel talks that happened in Oman and then ultimately for a large part of the negotiations that, that led to the deal. And so you're very familiar with you know, what it took to bring Iran to the table and what it took to get them engaged and get them eventually to sign on to JCPOA. Now, you know, we're sort of at a juncture. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know, hand-wringing about uh, you know, how do we proceed with Iran and, and uh, whether there's a pathway there. So I was wondering, uh, you know, how, how do you see this? That that is is there, a, and, and you know, obviously there are a set of issues that that came to the fore after the deal was signed: Iran's regional presence, the missiles issues, and host of other things. That that you know, how should the United States think about a diplomatic approach to getting back on? On, on a path with Iran that would be constructive and uh, whether you see that feasible in the short run, uh, in the long run, and what does it take from the United States to, 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 get, to get back to where you left off when, uh, when you left office? I mean, I think it's gonna be incredibly complicated to show that recovering diplomats like me still have a capacity for the blindingly obvious. Um, I think first, first you gotta look at the inheritance. And here I think the strategy of maximum pressure that you know, the Trump administration has employed has been quite foolish in my view. Of course, the United States through the power of our financial system can do enormous damage to the Iranian economy. But I think maximum pressure untethered to realistic goals is a form of coercive diplomacy that's all coercion and no diplomacy. Because I think that 
maximum pressure, even though President Trump himself insisted that it was aimed at producing a better deal, was actually tethered implicitly at least to two unrealistic aims, either the implosion of that regime or its capitulation. I don't need to be persuaded by anybody that Iranians with the Iranian people would be better off, I think, with a different regime um, and certainly, um, you know, a government which took a different approach to the rest of the world. Um, but I don't think those are realistic aims. And so I think maximum pressure has not produced, there's no evidence that it's produced progress along those lines. Not only do we not have a better deal, we have no deal at all. The reality is that the Iranians are, after we pulled out of the agreement, are steadily moving away from compliance with the comprehensive nuclear agreement today, I think. You know, the Iranians have 10 times the amount of enriched nuclear material that they had under the terms of the, the original terms of the JCPOA. Um, we've increased the risk of collisions between the United States and Iran or some of our partners in the Gulf and Iran um, in a part of the world that already has more than its share of violent collisions. We've done a lot of corrosive damage to our relationships with our closest European allies. Um, that wanted to make the comprehensive agreement work. In a sense, we've done Vladimir Putin's work for him by fraying those ties. And as you suggested earlier, Vali, I think we've created opportunities the Chinese uh, certainly couldn't have imagined a few years ago and that they're trying to take advantage of. So where do we go from here if you have a new administration? I can't speak for the Biden campaign, but you know, Vice President Biden has been clear in public in saying that he would be prepared to return to compliance with the comprehensive nuclear agreement if the Iranians are prepared to return fully to compliance. Now that's a lot easier said than done. Given um, the amount of damage that's been done in recent years, it's hard to predict exactly how the Iranian side would approach that, but it strikes me that that's a reasonable starting position. But what you would aim to do, it would seem to me, is to begin almost immediately uh, a kind of negotiation, a follow-on negotiation for how you strengthen the terms by mutual agreement of that original nuclear understanding to stretch out timelines, which are much closer to their expiration now than they were when the Trump administration took office and certainly than they were when it abandoned the nuclear agreement, to look for ways in parallel with that effort to you know, produce a follow-on agreement. And the truth is that if President Trump hadn't been elected and had you had a different administration, um, we would have been engaged, that, that administration would have been engaged, you know, several years ago probably in, in efforts at a follow-on agreement, um, just as in any arms control process, you build on top of one agreement to, you know, to try to create a better atmosphere over time. Um, so, you know, I think that's on, on the nuclear issue. And again, it remains to be seen whether that's possible, but it just seems to me that, you know, perfect is rarely on the menu in diplomacy and the you know, the best of the available alternatives, it seems to me, is that kind of an approach. It would also have to be, as you've argued publicly, um, coupled with parallel efforts to deal with some of the other areas in which Iranian behavior threatens our interests, uh, some of the other areas of uh, regional disorder in which the Iranians have played a part. Um, Yemen is one example, as I mentioned before. I don't think it's beyond diplomatic imagination or capacity, if there's sufficient will and drive um, to produce a diplomatic settlement in Yemen. Um, and that would require the United States and our partners pushing on Iran. And it would also require being very direct um, with the government of Saudi Arabia about that as well. Um, I think on Afghanistan is another area where, as you know, Vali, the United States and Iran, you know, after the fall of the Taliban, um, cooperated quite constructively, and it's an, an area where, you know, there's a useful conversation to be had. You know, other parts of the region in Syria are much more complicated, I think, right now. But you, you need to, rather than think unrealistically about some grand overarching agreement that you could pursue, it just seems to me that in the, in the realm of reality, what you'd have to try to do is on each of these issues, regional ones, nuclear ones, as well as ballistic missiles, to try to do the best you can to ease tensions, reduce threats, roll back, you know, the nature of the Iranian threat. Um, and, and missiles as well is, is something that we've, you know, talked about before. 
um, but which I think would, act, would have to be a, a separate but very serious track of that kind of an effort. The odds against success across that very complicated front are probably long. Um, there's also the question mark about what the actual inheritance if you have a new administration would be in January of 2021. People have talked for years about October surprises. I get worried about you know, November, December, January surprises as well, um, especially the kind of scorched earth tactics that an outgoing administration might engage in um, to box in the new administration um, in the incredibly difficult task of dealing with Iran. So I think we have to have our eyes wide open about the complexities of the challenge, about the reality of the threat that's posed in a lot of areas by this Iranian regime, about the wisdom of you know, trying to rekindle the habit of working with allies and partners, you know, whether it's the Europeans or, or those in the region as well. Um, but I think it's that approach which is anchored in diplomacy um, that's, that makes a lot more sense than what we've seen in recent years. One last question before I turn to the audience. In this vein, um, you know, what, what sort of trust building mechanisms, conflict building mechanisms you think off the bat, either Iran or the United States can provide to, to help the process that you laid out uh, get going since, since they haven't been talking at all yeah. in the past four years? I mean, part of it falls under the broad headline valley of kind of, um, you know, not making things worse, you know, a, a broad understanding of whether you call it calm for calm or something else where you're, you're, you're going to have consciously make an effort not to engage in, in actions which are going to only increase tensions and make it that much harder to explore the possibility of returning to the nuclear agreement or any of the other steps that I described before. I think there's some practical steps that you could, part of it is rhetorical as well. I think, you know, the rhetoric of this administration, notwithstanding the fact that Iranian behavior, the behavior of this Iranian regime um, can be incredibly destructive in a lot of different ways, not least in detaining, you know, deeply unjustly, you know, American citizens and others in Iran. Um, but notwithstanding that, I think the rhetoric of this administration has gen, you know, generally been over the top. You know, Secretary Pompeo, I think a week ago, was quoted as saying that Iran is you know, the greatest international threat to the United States. I, again, I don't need anybody to convince me of the, of the ways, the many ways in which Iran threatens American interests, or this Iranian regime does. But to say that it's the greatest international threat um, exaggerates, you know, Iranian influence in ways which really aren't helpful in American strategy and in a sense only boost the egos of people in the Iranian regime as well. You can look at more practical measures that, you know, we've explored in the past, uh, communications channels to try to avoid collisions uh, in the Gulf itself, which as you well know is, you know, such a narrow constricted body of water. So there, there are a number of steps that you could take um, practically and rhetorically that I think might help de-escalate tensions and provide some space for the more ambitious steps that you know we were just talking about. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, uh, Nargis, I think you know we have some time for questions if you want to moderate that. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Burns. So some of the questions that are coming in from the audience, one of them asks, how do you see the future of U.S. Uh, policy towards Israel and their stance regarding the Palestinian issue? Um, well, I guess I think, you know, first, uh, the U.S.-Israeli relationship, I think, is a very important one. I think the United States is going to remain committed and should remain committed to Israel's security. Um, I think we, I think you're likely to see in a new administration, if there is a new administration in January of 2021, pretty significant step away from what I judge to be the foolishness of the so-called deal of the century that you know the Trump White House put forward with regard to the Palestinian-Israeli issue. I think it, it's based on a series of false assumptions. The false assumption that the United States can actually contribute to progress toward a two-state solution by working over or around Palestinians. The false assumption that you can substitute economic incentives for political dignity and the realization of political aspirations, which is also an illusion. The false assumption in a way that, that time is on our side in the sense of you know, the demographic realities, 
um, suggest very clearly that within the next decade or two, Arabs are going to be in a majority in the land that Israel controls from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, which means that it becomes increasingly difficult in those circumstances to sustain Israel as a Jewish democratic state in those kind of circumstances. So while the steps toward normalization between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain were positive achievements in many respects. They have to be tethered to realistic strategies on both the Palestinian issue and on Iran, as we discussed before. And I see no evidence in this administration that that's the case. There's a follow-up issue, a uh, question on this, and then there's a, a question that brings us back to Iran, which I'll ask in a second. Um, the follow-up question is how um, how do you see the if the administration changes after November, um, negotiating with the Netanyahu administration in Israel, given how uh, incredibly close it has gotten to the Trump administration and, and how it treated um, the, the Obama administration with the JCPOA uh, and, and the potential if Biden chooses to go back to the deal. Uh, so sort of um, further thinking about Israel, but bringing into the calculation Netanyahu and his positions vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Yeah, well, I think there's no question that it's gonna be important if there's a new administration to be very honest, you know, about um, everything from a commitment to trying to return to the Iranian nuclear agreement, if Iran is prepared to return fully, um, to, you know, a shift from some of the positions that the Trump administration has taken on the Palestinian issue. I mean, I would imagine that it'd be very important to restore not only the, the formal, you know, diplomatic links to the Palestinian leadership that you know, were embodied in the consulate general in Jerusalem. Um, but also it makes perfect sense in humanitarian terms to restore assistance, um, you know, the, the kind of humanitarian assistance both to the Palestinian Authority and to UNRWA um, that the United States has been engaged in for administrations before too. So I expect there'd be some fairly candid conversations about the, those issues as well. And honest ones about, you know, the ways in which um, you know, the United States wants to continue to contribute to Israel's security, is committed to doing that. But to be honest about our concerns about, you know, a, a, an expiration of the two-state solution as well, which isn't going to do anything good for either Palestinians or Israelis. The next, uh, I'm going to bunch a couple of questions, and uh, there, um, for the audience has asked this of both Ambassador Burns and Professor Nast um, about the significance of June's elections in Iran, uh, the presidential elections coming up in June, uh, on the prospect of rekindling diplomacy between the two countries, and if. Um, uh, if you uh, believe that the Biden administration would agree to Iranian demands for compensation um, for leaving the JCPOA in order to come back, and how does that window of time, if we have a new administration come June, uh, January between the upcoming elections and June in Iran, how do you guys sort of see this, uh, this constellation of, of events affecting potential diplomacy? A really good question. So Ali, do you wanna go first and then I'll, I'll jump in after you? Uh, sure. Uh, I think on the on the elections uh, in Iran, uh, there's no question that the that the past four years and the experience of the um, of the maximum pressure has shaped Iranian politics to a significant degree. There's a lot of talk about uh, a much greater role for conservatives for for members of the IRGC and and that the the moderates have lost a lot of lot of ground. But I would say that uh, at least my sense is that it will not be known who's going to run in Iranian presidential elections and uh, who might have a chance until uh, we know what happens on November 3rd. And I think some of the steps that Bill laid out, if they actually yield results, imagine if the two countries, for instance, are inching their way back into JCPOA, or at least have done what Bill mentioned, in other words, agreed to go back as a first phase, I think that would be very decisive uh, in whether actually serious moderate candidates would even consider running, as opposed to a situation if President Trump gets elected, 
and there is no point for a moderate to even want to run because there's no prospect of, of, of engagement. So I don't think at least, and I guess you can correct me that in, in, in our, our memory that, that uh, an outcome of an American presidential election would be so decisive on, on the presidential elections uh, in Iran. You know, I, I no, I broadly agree, Vali, too. I mean, I think, well, the first thing I'd say, and I draw on my own experience on this over, you know, three and a half decades as an American diplomat, most of whose gray hair came, I think, from dealing with this issue of Iran, you know, we're, we're not very good at gaming Iranian politics. And the whole issue that, you know, Americans get mesmerized about, about, you know, moderates and hardliners and moderates, and, you know, we're, we're um, we have, do not have a particularly good track record at doing that. So I think- no, know, no, Very quickly, I would say, Bill, you're the only person I know who can explain to people that there might be a difference talking to Saeed Jalili and Javad Zarif from your own personal experience. Yeah, no, I can. And, and I suffered through many long lectures from Saeed Jalili. I remember him once saying as an aside in the middle of a two hour monologue about all sorts of things that had no relevance to the particular issue we were trying to push him on in the P5 plus one talks. He mentioned as an aside that he continued to lecture at Tehran University. I remember passing a note to one of my European colleagues saying, I don't envy his students. Um, so yeah, the, the styles are much different. Um, it was a much different world in many respects, at least tactically and stylistically negotiating with the Rouhani generation of, you know, Iranian negotiators, no less tough-minded um, and no less, you know, difficult to deal with and no less infuriating in some ways, but a much different style. So I think, anyway, the, the question is a really good one. It's important to be very well aware of that kind of narrow window before the Iranian presidential elections. But beyond that, I think the notion of sort of gaming that from the point of view of what steps the United States takes, um, you know, can just complicate efforts. I, I, I think what I tried to lay out before and what Vali has written about seems to me to be the best of the available alternatives for testing the proposition that we can return to diplomacy with Iran. The, um, the next couple of questions sort of return us to thinking uh, not only just about Iran, but the broader region and the US's role. So one of them asks, um, an audience member asks, do you see any possibility of broader multilateral security arrangements in the Middle East, including the Arab Gulf states, Israel, Iran, and Turkey, as well as the US, Russia, and China? It's a big question, but sort of thinking more broadly about potential multilateralism in the region. You know, no, not anytime soon is the honest answer. I mean, you know, the Middle East has been a graveyard over the decades for grand ambitious structures like that. Um, and Americans have been guilty about pushing some of them too. I think you have to build, given the nature of the tensions and the dysfunctions and the rivalries in the region, you, you have to build step by step. You know, the, the comprehensive nuclear agreement was meant to be one step. It was not meant to be the end of diplomacy. It was meant to be the beginning of it so that you would try to use whatever momentum you built on that issue to try to deal constructively with a number of other very hard issues in dealing with Iran, regional issues, ballistic missile issues, and other ones. So I think it's, it's fine and in some ways it's sensible to have a broader long-term vision of my, what might be possible. And there've been a lot of ideas put out there over the years about ways in which you can, you know, begin to create confidence building measures in the Gulf, begin to create greater transparency amongst militaries in the region. Um, you know, the kinds of things that have worked in different areas in other parts of the world. But I think rather than leap to one grand architecture, it's gonna be much more a function of sort of building from the ground up step by step, accepting that there are gonna be more failures than successes but keeping at it diplomatically because that persistence, tough-minded persistence is gonna be really essential. Um, there are some questions on Iraq and Syria and the US's uh, stance towards them. So one audience member asks, um, is the US starting to look towards Iraq 
uh, post the ISIS campaign more through an Iranian lens. Um, I, and then they follow up and they say where Iraq is just another field to gain some cumulative points prior to any potential negotiations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran and the US. So sort of thinking of Iraq as uh, or how is the, how could potentially the United States think about Iraq in its negotiations with Iran? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the mistakes we've made in recent years is to kind of shoehorn everything in American Middle East policy um, through the prism of dealing with Iran and the Iranian threat. As I said before, it's a hugely significant challenge for the United States, but there are others as well. And so it seems to me the best way for American policy to look at Iraq is in um, you know, in furtherance of our interest in a strong sovereign Iraq, which is saying a lot because there's still huge challenges in Iraq. That's not to suggest that Iran is not gonna to want to exert influence in Iraq, um, but it is to suggest that I've always thought that over time, you know, the bonds of, you know, Iraqi national sentiment can trump Shia bonds that, you know, might connect, you know, Iranians, the Iranian and Iraqi governments as well. So I think, you know, working with others to invest step by step in, you know, a stronger, more sovereign Iraq um, is probably the smartest element of American, you know, strategy. Um, that's the best way of dealing with, you know, the, the question of Iranian influence. But it's a more affirmative way of looking at the question that you just posed, as opposed to just seeing this through the prism of, you know, what is a very real competition with Iran. Mm -hmm. And the question of uh, Syria that one audience member has is what should be um, the US policy stances towards Syria in a potential uh, Biden and, or with, with a change in administration? Um, how should the United States engage with Syria? Well, oh, that's, I mean, it's, um, you know, such an awful mess in so many ways, especially in human ones for Syrians, you know, those who've lost their lives in Syria, those who's lives have been disrupted, those Syrians who are outside Syria's borders today, um, which has, you know, imposed huge burdens in Jordan and Lebanon and other parts of the region as well. So I think the United States first and most obvious needs to refocus on what it can do to support the humanitarian needs, you know, of those Syrians who have been displaced or, you know, um, you know their lives totally disrupted by this conflict. I think you know, we'll wanna do what we can to ensure that the various frictions in the region, whether it's involving the Turks or the Russians or anyone else, the Iranians um, don't spin out of control because the last thing Syria needs is even greater violence. There's always a danger of that with regard to Syrian Kurds and, and Turkey. And so that's you know, an important role I think for American diplomacy. Um, it's hard to see um, you know, any near-term possibility that the Assad regime is gonna negotiate itself out of existence. Um, I, I think it's important to, you know, re retain the aspirational goal of a Syria that's free of the Assad regime and all of its brutalities. Um, but that's, that's not a near-term possibility, I don't think as well. So there's, there's gonna be a continuing role for American diplomacy. There's gonna be a continuing role for, you know, providing humanitarian support to Syrians then, to, you know, Syrian refugees, as well as to governments in Lebanon and Jordan, which are, you know, uh, face huge burdens of their own right now as well. It's not a wildly ambitious agenda, but I just think if there's one thing that we've learned in Syria is that, you know, we have to be careful and realistic about what's possible. Thank you. Um, and the final um, questions return a little bit to Israel and the Arab um, Arab Israeli peace agenda that the Trump administration has laid out and asking if uh, do you see this as a continuing trend uh, or as this question as the audience member asked, was this just a propaganda for winning the election? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think some of the architects of the so-called deal of the century, um, you know, were convinced of its wisdom. So it wasn't just for propaganda's sake. I have no idea how President Trump has seen it or sees it. I doubt he's spent much uh, time on the details of that plan. Um, but I think the insidious part of it is that, you know, it, it at least on the part of some of the architects of that plan, I think it's meant to bury a two-state solution. 
or at least a workable two-state solution of the sort that you can see a reasonable chance of Palestinians accepting. Now here, I'm not trying to absolve the Palestinian leadership of you know, their own mistakes over the years or their own poor governance or corruption today. Um, but I think, as I said before, um, you know, the United States continues to have an interest um, in preserving the possibility of a two-state solution. And so what that's gonna mean, I think, if you have a new administration is moving away um, in some significant ways from the approach of the Trump administration from you know, what was laid out in the deal of the century, because I don't think there's any prospect in the world that that deal of the century plan is gonna produce a two-state solution. What it's more likely to produce is you know, continued massive settlement construction activity, um, the, the very real possibility of further annexations in the West Bank um, and you know, a reality in which the two-state solution is buried. And, and I think, as I said before, um, that doesn't serve, in, in my view anyway, as a friend of Israel, um, the long-term interests of Israelis, nor does it serve the long-term interests of Palestinians, and it certainly doesn't serve American interests. Thank you so much. Um, Fadi, did you want to Sure. No, I, I think I wanted to th thank Ambassador Burns for an incredibly rich uh, conversation. Uh, it uh, really lays out not only problems that we're facing in the foreign policy arena with Iran and the Middle East, but also elements of how we ought to think about the future if we're going to get back on an even keel. Thanks again for joining us at SAIS, and we hope to host you again in the future as, as this story unfolds. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks. Thank Great you. to be with you guys. Uh, Thank right. you.